Good morning, church. Good morning. My name is Jill. Thanks for joining us for worship today. Just a reminder that we have an exciting and safe kids environment in both our morning services. Um, there, it's from ages birth to grade five, and there's still time to check your kids in. If you need help finding whereabouts that is, you can find an usher and they will show you whereabouts you can go for that. As a church, our vision is to strengthen families towards a transformed community. Here's a few things to help you stay connected. Thanks, Jill. My name's Kim, and I'm so excited that you're here as well this morning. Uh, Christmas season has come upon us, and to help you inviting your friends out, you can pick up this Christmas at Faith card at the Connection Center. And yes, a few events have already passed, but you can still take this and use it to invite out your friends to any of our upcoming events. Now, I just want to take a moment and thank those of you who have filled a red sock. Thank you for doing that. They need to be back today so that we can get them into the hands of those Muskoka families before Christmas. Now, um, just before the service, I checked, and we still need 10 more socks to be filled. So if you can pick those up and bring them back next week, that would be fantastic. And we just want to thank you for taking part in the opportunity to share Christ's love with families in Muskoka this Christmas. Pastor, Pastor Daryl is starting a new three-part Christmas teaching series today, and it's called Christmas Is For You. Be sure to come back each Sunday through December 23rd as well, um, just so that we can stay together through this series. On Saturday, December 22nd, please join us at the Canada Summit Center as we're sponsoring a public skate that day from 12 until 2. This is a great opportunity for you to reach out and invite your friends and family to come join and hang out with us that day. You know, another great opportunity for you to invite up to friends is the Christmas Eve service. That is coming up. It is on the 24th. It is 6 and 8 p.m. They are both the same service. And at them, we are going to be enjoying a great time together with friends and family. We'll sing traditional Christmas carols. Pastor Daryl has a special Christmas message. And uh, to help you invite out your friends, we have these invites that you can pick up at the Connection Center. On the back side, they are blank so that you can take them and you can write a personal message and then hand it to someone that you're inviting. We look forward to seeing you there and make sure that you pick this up at the Connection Center before you leave today. If you're visiting us for the first time, welcome and we're glad that you've chosen to spend your morning here with us. If you connect um, back at the Connection Center out in the foyer afterwards, we've got a small gift to place in your hands. It's just a token of appreciation that we're glad that you spent this morning with us um, here th uh, at church this morning, and we hope to see you back next Sunday. We have an exciting service lined up for you, but before we get started with some singing, let's all stand up and greet one another and have a great morning at Faith. to have you here. We're going to start with some Christmas songs this morning. We welcome our Savior. We're going to sing Joy to the World. Sing it out together. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let her receive a King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing And heaven and heaven and nature Joy to the world, the Savior reigns Let men the songs in Lord While fields and floods, rocks, hills and plains Repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat. 
You guys are good, I'm wrong. That's better. Listen to that. We're gonna raise our voices with the angels this morning. We're gonna sing Hark the Hair. Sing it in. Here we go. Hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy, my old God and sin is reconciled.
great hope, what a great truth. Why don't you guys have a seat? Well, this Christmas season, we have the opportunity to uh, give above and beyond our regular tithes and offerings towards our, our 2018 Christmas giving campaign. And this year, that, uh, those funds are uh, going towards uh, the building um, of a uh, birthing station in, in the Congo. And we have missionary partners who uh, work in the Congo, um, uh, Brenda and Richard Fleming. And uh, actually, Richard, is Brenda going to be here next week too? Brenda and Richard are both going to be here next week, and we'll hear more about this project. But we're partnering with other churches across the country towards uh, uh, raising funds for this. And it's a great opportunity for us to uh, really have um, an impact around the world on families as well as here at home. And so we just uh, encourage everybody to be prayerfully considering over the, the next few weeks uh, giving towards that, and the instructions of how you can give are up on the screen. If you're giving in-house here this morning by envelope, just make sure that you mark off uh, what what amount is for Christmas. <clears throat> if it's not marked for Christmas, it does go to the general fund. Um, but uh, just mark that down. Again, be praying through this season as you consider how you uh, will have, us have a part in that uh, campaign. All right, cool. Let's pray together as we uh, continue in worship and we bring our tithes and offerings this morning. Father, what an opportunity it is to come together here as the local church at Faith Baptist Church and, and lift high your name and, and really uh, set ourselves off into the Christmas season um, and lift just in praise. Yeah, so starting in worship uh, this Christmas season as we welcome uh, our Savior. And I just pray that as we move through Christmas, we would not lose sight of the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Um, and may that hope be shared outward. Would you give us boldness uh, to... Uh, not only live a life that's evident of the gospel in us, uh, but may we may you give us words to say and opportunities uh, to share and to invite friends into that hope. And maybe that first step would be an invitation to an event like that public skate coming up. Maybe it would be an invitation to Christmas Eve. Um, maybe an invitation to coffee where you wanted to share something with that friend, the hope of the gospel, but you have never taken that time. I just pray you give us boldness to, to do that. And as we head through this Christmas season, may we not get caught up in the busyness of home and the busyness of work and the busyness of church life, but may we uh, be able to keep our focus on our Savior, Jesus Christ, and, and what that means uh, ultimately through the grace that you have given us, Father. So uh, go ahead of us, and we, you know, right now we come and we continue in, in worship. We've been singing songs to you, and we lift high your name, and, and uh, we come to Christmas, there's some carols that have some amazing truths in them, and we're so glad to be able to sing them. And, uh, but as we continue in worship this morning, may uh, the gifts that we bring back, the tithes, the offerings, may they really be a reflection of our, of our heart of worship, just like we've been singing. Um, and I pray that uh, you be honored by the gifts we bring this morning, and I pray for our Christmas campaign as well, that you would bless it, and that uh, we would just see lives impacted around the world, and ultimately the truth of Jesus Christ shared uh, there as well. We pray these things, trusting you for what's ahead. Go before us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Jillian. That was tremendous. We appreciate that so much. I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. If you would, please, Luke chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 14. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. Just while you're finding uh, that section in your Bible, uh, probably many of you have been aware of this, but uh, yesterday morning at about 7 o'clock, uh, Dave and uh, Denise... Um, Stoneman, uh, their house, basically there was an explosion. Uh, we understand it was a propane explosion, and their house is totally gone. Uh, I saw a picture of it, and there's basically one wall standing by the look of it. So they have lost literally everything. They got out with the clothes that are on their back, and that's about it. Uh, Dave and uh, Denise are... Uh, are, are well. Uh, they had their nephew Noah living with them. Uh, Noah has burns to his hands, his feet, and also to the side of his head and face. He's down in Sick Kids Hospital right now, and it's not life threatening as far as we know at this point. But uh, he's going to be there for the next few days, and so we need to pray for the uh, the Stoneman family. Uh, again, they're starting from scratch, and so we are as a church going to be taking a love offering for them over the next few weeks as well. Now I know that means we. We have two love offerings uh, that are going on. So if you're giving to the Congo, you need to make that very clear, de designate to the Congo or, or Christmas uh, offering, something like that. And if you're going to donate to the Stomans, then make sure that name appears on your envelope because we want to make sure that uh, your donation gets to where you want it to go. So uh, I, I know that we're a very generous church. I know you're going to give to this. And so uh, over the next few weeks, we're going to keep that open. And as, as you give it to us, then we're going to pass it along to them as well. Now, let me just say this. I know after the service, you're going to come to us and say, well, do they have a place to live? And what about this? What about that? I'll just tell you right now, we don't know. This is fresh. This happened 7 o'clock yesterday morning. We haven't had a chance to have a lot of communication with them. As soon as we know anything, we will let you know. So it's rather frustrating, but that's kind of where we're at right now. But again, uh, just con consider what you can do to help them uh, financially at this time. There'll be other things that we can do uh, as the months and uh, as the year rolls along. But right now, the initial need, I think, is for some finances. And we appreciate whatever sacrifice you're going to make for them at this time. But let's just take a moment and pray for that family, shall we? 
Our God and our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way that you preserved the life of, of Dave and Denise and Noah. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with Noah as he's recovering down in Sick Kids Hospital. We pray that, uh, we thank you for the good care that he's receiving down there. And we just pray, Lord, that as their whole world has been turned upside down, that you would make your presence uh, very known to them, that you would give them your strength during these days. And may we as a church just surround them and support them. May they sense the love from, uh, from our church family, from their own families and from their friends as well. And Father, we just pray that uh, as we are able, that you allow us to give, to give sacrificially uh, for them at this time. Father, we also thank you for allowing us to be here this morning to study your word and to uh, be led of the Spirit of God. We pray that we may be attentive and that wherever, uh, whatever you uh, teach us, whatever you command, we may be obedient to it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. Now, just before we read this, I, I, I just want to comment on this uh, uh, Christmas decoration behind me. I think it's absolutely wonderful. I saw it for the first time this morning myself. And, um, yeah, I think it looks just great. And just so you know, I was told there are 25,000 individual links in this display up here, okay? And uh, Elaine Greenfield, actually, uh, uh, with a number of her friends, uh, actually did all of this. And so we appreciate so much uh, her work in that. All right, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. I'm going to read it from my Bible. Follow along in your Bibles, if you would, please. And the words will appear on the screen behind me as well. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. I think it was earlier this year, I was watching a TV series on the PBS channel, and it was about a woman who was actually traveling down the Nile River. And as she traveled down the Nile River, she would stop at various cities and different areas, and she would give a report on the people and, and what was going on in that particular area. Now, as you know, the Nile River is a significant body of water. Uh, some say it's the longest river in the world. Some say the Amazon is. I have no idea, but I'm going to go with the Nile for now. It is a significant uh, uh, body of water. Uh, it, covers, it flows through 11 different countries. It's been used for centuries as a, as a transportation route. They actually uh, transport goods up and down the Nile River. It's the primary water source of Egypt as well as the Sudan. In fact, 95% of Egypt's population depend on its water and live within a few miles of the, of the riverbanks. Now, getting back to the PBS show, the host actually uh, eventually came to what they said was the the actual uh, uh, source of the Nile. And, and what was actually interesting is the source of the Nile, according to them, and they showed it was this tiny little stream that somebody could actually step over, a child could step over. And it's interesting to think that this huge body of water that supports vast numbers of people, that flows through so many different countries, actually begins as a small stream in a wilderness that hardly anyone is even aware of. And when I think of the humble beginnings of the Nile River, I'm reminded of the birth of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus enters into this world by human standards was a rather ignoble beginning. As Luke tells us here, 
He was born in a place where they kept animals. His first bed was actually an animal trough. His parents were dirt poor. His prospects from a <clears throat> excuse me, human point of view definitely were not great. There were no banners to welcome his arrival. There were no bands to usher him into this world. In fact, when you read actually verses 1 through 7 of, of Luke chapter 2, there's nothing that causes us to suspect that he was any different from any other baby that was born at that, at that time. And yet, like the Nile River, from such a, an inconsequential beginning, his impact, his influence has grown until eventually, today, it has saturated the entire globe, the entire world. It's interesting when you study the life of Christ from, because from almost day one, he's either been a threat or he's been a blessing to all the kings and rulers who have ever sat upon a throne. Initially, his followers numbered slightly over 100. Today, they number in the billions. You can honestly say he's the most contro controversial figure in the history of the world. 2,000 years have come and gone. And today he is arguably the central figure of the entire human race. And so today we begin a series, a Christmas series, celebrating his arrival, the arrival on God to earth, the arrival or, or the incarnation. Now, I find it interesting, and I've read a number of these articles and blogs over the last few weeks. There are some in the church who are actually wondering and questioning whether or not, as Christians, we should even celebrate Christmas. They think maybe it would be better to set that aside. And granted, there are no biblical commands to celebrate Christmas. There, there, there's, there's no instructions that we are to, to, uh, to, to remember uh, in the weeks coming up to Christmas, the, the Advent season. And, and there's no doubt whatsoever that Christmas itself has basically become a, an excuse for self-indulgence. Materialism runs rampant. Partying goes on all the time. And it's degenerated into a secularized social event that for the most part misses entirely its true meaning. Nobody would argue that point. But there's an old Latin expression that when translated means this. The abuse of something shouldn't be allowed to destroy its proper use. I think of that when I think of Christmas. In an article entitled, Should Christians Abandon Christmas? Singler Ferguson writes, Sinclair Ferguson writes, It's true that the Roman festival of Saturnalia took place in December. But Christmas celebrations didn't so much grow out of it as grow against it. And in contrast to it, Saturnalia was an excuse for excess, for what the world still calls having a good time, often meaning getting wasted, headache and all. Christians in antiquity wanted to live a counterculture life, not to, let, not to let Saturnalia squeeze them into its mold. And they knew they had something worth celebrating, or rather, someone worth celebrating. And so they met together to celebrate the birth of their Savior. And that is what we want to do. And for the next three weeks, we're going to focus on this world-changing, life-altering event. And hopefully through these studies, discover again the love that God has shown and demonstrated to us as a human race. Now, you have your Bibles open before you. Take a look again at Luke 1, this time, sorry, Luke 2, verses 1 through 7. These words are so familiar to us that there's always the danger that we can read them without really hearing what they say. That's a problem when we become familiar with the passage. But you notice, as I know you do, it begins with the announcement of a census taken by Caesar Augustus. And the purpose of the census basically was twofold. The first purpose was so that he could charge taxes. He wanted to know how many people lived in his, in his kingdom so that he could actually level a tax against them. The second purpose was so that he could find out exactly how many young men he could draft into his army. That's another reason why the census was actually taken. Now, as probably many of you know, Caesar Augustus was not his real name. His real name was Gaius Octavius. And he was 
depending what source you read, either the adopted nephew or the adopted son of Julius Caesar. Caesar itself is a title. It's kind of like the way we use the term king or president or prime minister today. And Augustus really indicated how the people felt about him. Augustus means great, uh, venerable. And that's how the Roman people viewed Caesar Augustus because, because he had done so many great things. Uh, he, he had provided the Roman people with, with many things like the, the peace of Rome and free travel and uh, safe travel and so on and so forth. But even though he was known for many great things, the greatest thing that he ever did, totally unknown to him, was to issue this census right here. Of course, he didn't have a clue what was doing, but God being sovereign was behind the scenes orchestrating all of these events. See, by calling for the census, he moved Joseph and Mary from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And that was absolutely necessary for prophecy to be fulfilled. In one of the minor prophets, a prophet by the name of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, we read these words. But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Here was a prophet, hundreds of years before Luke chapter 2 ever took place, was foretelling the fact that a savior, a ruler was going to be born. And in order for this prophecy to be fulfilled, it was necessary for Joseph and Mary to actually find themselves in the little town of Bethlehem. And so with the stage being set, the only thing that was left was the birth of the baby. And we have the record of that here in verses 6 and 7. And it says, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, I hear that, that statement and I ask myself, could there be a, a more understated comment about such an epic moment in human history? Because what we just read there is God the second person of the Trinity, the creator of all things, has come into this world as a helpless baby, born in a stable, placed in a manger, a feeding trough. And it was the start of a life that would revolutionize the entire world. See, we need to understand from this moment on, it would be a steady march until... Finally, Jesus arrived at the cross, and then following the cross was the empty tomb. The Apostle Peter, writing about these things in, in the first epistle that he wrote, the first letter that he wrote, makes this statement. He says, concerning this salvation, the prophets, like Micah that I just talked about, who spoke of the grace that was to come, searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Now, did you hear what the Apostle Peter just told us? He says that prophecy that we just read from Micah and others like that, like in, in Nea, or I'm sorry, like in Isaiah and, and things like that, uh, this birth account that's recorded for us in, in Luke chapter 2, uh, the account of Jesus' death, his, his burial, his resurrection, all of that had been a mystery since the beginning of time, since, since creation itself. In fact, we're told that the prophets, even, even they didn't get it. They were the ones that recorded this message. But they didn't fully understand what was going on. In fact, Peter tells us even the angels long to look into these things. They wanted to study these things for themselves. Even the angels didn't fully grasp what God was about to do. 
And so we ask ourselves, so then what was the point of these prophetic messages? Why did Isaiah and Micah and those like them even foretold about the coming of, of Jesus Christ? Well, you notice Peter told us very clearly, it wasn't for them, it was for you. That's what Peter tells us here. All these prophecies were not for the prophets. They didn't fully understand them. No, these prophecies were actually for you, and they were for me. That's what he says in verse 12. They were not serving themselves, but you. When they spoke of these things that have been told, that have been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. You see the emphasis there. It wasn't for them. It was for you. It wasn't for the prophets. It was for you. Even the angels longed to look into it, but they didn't understand it because this is for you. See, what we need to understand is Christmas really is for you. So the salvation story that begins in the manger is actually for you. Jesus came to this earth for you. The Bible tells us that over and over again. In fact, that's really what the message of the angels was in Luke chapter 2. And we see this interaction between the angels and the shepherds. And as you listen to this message, you'll see that it really does reinforce what Peter tells us in his first letter. Take a look at this message from the angels beginning, beginning in verse 8 of Luke, 2, of, of Luke 2. It says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. <clears throat> you will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Now this is an interesting interaction between these supernatural beings and these shepherds. Now, the shepherds were fulfilling the role at this point, kind of like the, the night watchmen of our own generation. In actual fact, they lived with the sheep 24-7. Unless they were the owners of the sheep, these individuals were probably hired hands. And it was their responsibility to watch the sheep day and night to move those sheep whenever they needed fresh water or, or fresh grazing land. They were there to protect the sheep. There were wild animals in the land. There, there were people who would rob, rob the sheep. There are a number of dangers that existed. Now, if you were a shepherd, for the most part, it was a, a rather monotonous life. Not a lot happened. But it, every once in a while, it, would, it was interspersed with moments of sheer hot, heart-stopping action. When a wild animal came, when a, when a robber approached, all of a sudden then, all the senses came alive. Well, this night that's recorded for us in Luke chapter 2 is one of those rare moments when something happened. From a human perspective, it was unexplainable. It says, while they were watching the sheep, all of a sudden, an angel appears to them and gives them a very specific message. In fact, what we are told is that an angel appears and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Now, now just imagine that for a moment. Picture what it's like. You, many of you have been to Algonquin Park and you, you've slept in, in Algonquin Park and a tent and so on. Imagine you're sitting around the campfire one night and all of a sudden, I've got some background music. This is good. This, <laughs> boy, build that up. We could really get this thing going. You're, you know, let me go back. We're in Algonquin Park. You're sitting around a campfire and all of a sudden, this figure stands at the edge of your campsite. And this huge light surrounds him and surrounds you. That would wake you up, wouldn't it? I mean, that's what they are experiencing there. And he has a very specific message for them. Now, it's also a general message. He says, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. The message is for the general population. In other words, this is not a message for a select few. The angel did not say, I have a message for the king. 
and for the ruling class of society. He didn't say, this is a message for the priests or the rulers in the temple. He didn't say this is for the rich and the powerful. It's not simply for the influential. See, this is for all the people. That's why it begins with the shepherd. Isn't it interesting that the first time this message is shared is with the shepherds? Now, you've heard through other sermons, through your own study, that the shepherds were kind of at the bottom rung of the social ladder of that society. They were kind of looked down upon. I mean, for the most part, they lived outside all the time. They, they couldn't take regular baths. They lived with sheep. And, and so they kind of were on the fringe of society. But they're a good representation of all of us. Because if, if the message is for them, which it was, it means it's for each one of us as well. Every man, woman, and child who has ever been, who will ever be, needs to hear this message that the angels are giving, needs to hear this message that you and I have just read about here in Luke chapter 2. In fact, it's interesting, when Jesus grows to be a man, in fact, after his death, burial, and resurrection, he's speaking to the disciples for the last time, and the last instructions that he gives his disciples actually echo this message of the angel. Most of you are familiar with it from Matthew chapter 28. Jesus says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Who did he send them to? Who are they to deliver the message to? To all the nations. Not just the Jews, not just to a select few, but he said everybody, everybody needs to hear this message. That's one of the reasons why I think it is so important for us as followers of Christ to actually celebrate Christmas. It's one of the few times during the year when the entire world is paying attention to the message that the angel gave 2,000 years ago. They're hearing about the birth of Jesus, what he came to do, what he accomplished while he walked this earth. And so this is not the time for the church to remain silent. This is a time for the church to speak up. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. But I want to get back to what I said previously. This is more than just a general message for the world. This is a message that needs to be heard by us as individuals. I'm sure you heard the emphasis of the angel's message is the same emphasis that we heard Peter give in in his first epistle. And the emphasis is this. This message is for you. Yes, it's for everybody. But don't lose the fact it's for you. It's for you. It's for me. Notice again what he says. the, The angel says, I bring you good news of great joy. Verse 11. Today in the town of David... A Savior has been born to you. Verse 12, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. As much as this is a general message for everyone, which it is, we have to take this message, we have to take this truth, and we have to apply it to ourselves. That's why we've entitled this series, Christmas is for You. I mean, what good is an invitation? What good is a warning? What good is an announcement if we don't take it personally and respond to it ourselves? See, it does us absolutely no good to be aware of, to know the details of the salvation message. If we don't take those details, if we don't take that information and begin to apply it to our own life, to our own heart. You know, rather, one of the rather depressing sides of Christmas is we know that all this attention to the coming of our Lord that, that is given at this time of year is never appropriated by, by many people, by most people. In spite of the fact that the, the message is all around us. We sing about it. We read about it. There are people who are, who are seeing nativities every day. But the coin never drops. They never say, I need this for myself. And the message is so clear here. 
Look again at what the angel says. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. There are three different titles that are given to Jesus in that statement. It begins by saying, a Savior has been born. Now, that is saying something. We need to understand what, what the angel is saying here because to receive a Savior, you have to realize that you need to be saved. If you don't realize you need to be saved, then the fact that Jesus is a Savior doesn't mean anything to you. And we realize that we need to be saved because we realize that we are sinners. See, we have to confess that we are sinners. And to be a sinner simply means we haven't lived up to the standards of God. And you know what the standards of God are, don't you? Perfection. 100% perfect. And nobody can live up to that standard. I wouldn't ask you to raise your hand, but I mean, does anybody here really think they're perfect? Ask your wife. She'll tell you otherwise. I'm telling you right now. There's no such thing as perfection. I, I mean, we should be convinced of that. The Bible tells us that, that all have sinned. <clears throat> when it says all have sinned, that includes me. That include, includes you as well. The Bible tells us there's not one who is righteous. That doesn't mean that we can't do good. We can do some good things, some, some great things. But we're not righteous in and of ourselves. That's why we need a Savior. That's the first part of this message. And then the angel goes on and he says, he is Christ. The word literally means he's the anointed one. The one chosen by God to reconcile man to God. See, there are not a lot of options when it comes to the Christmas story. There's not a lot of choices here. We can choose life with Jesus or we can choose eternal death without him. But that choice lies with us because he's the Christ, the chosen one. And then he says, he's the Lord. He's the one that we bow down, that we bow down to. He's the one that we give our lives to. It is to him that we look to for direction and guidance in all areas of our life. Why? Because he's God. That's why he's Lord. He's God incarnate, God in the flesh. That's why he's our Savior the Christ, the Lord. I mentioned a moment ago, there are so many people during this season who, who are exposed to this message all the time, almost every day. And may I be bold enough to ask you, could you be one of those people and you still haven't fully surrendered your life to Christ? I mean, we sing the songs. We, we sang them this morning. Uh, one of the lines, Hark the Herald Angel Sings, is, Jesus, our Emmanuel. You saying that this morning, is it true? Is he really your Emmanuel? Or was that just a line in a Christmas carol that we sing without even thinking about? Emmanuel, by the way, means God with us. Is God with you? Have you asked him to be part of your life? If not... Let me just encourage you to pray. Ask him to forgive you of your sin, to accept him as your Lord and as your Savior. That's what Christmas is all about. That's really what we're here to celebrate. We enjoy the trees and the presents and the lights and, and all of that. I enjoy all those things. But ultimately, we can never forget the fact that Christmas is about Jesus. That's why Jesus came, to reconcile us to God. If you'd like to do that, if you have done that, I'd like to talk to somebody about it, come down front at the end of the service or somebody here to pray with you or, or speak to me at the back. I would love to take a few moments and talk to you more about, about that because that's what Christmas is all about. Christmas is for you to know Jesus as your Savior. But Christmas is a general message for, for everybody. It's also a message that needs to be applied as individuals, but, but as I've already alluded to, it's more than that even. It's a message that needs to be shared. We need to take this message that we have received and we need to share that with others as well. We didn't read far enough in this passage, but, but a few verses after where we stop, it tells us what the shepherds did after they saw the baby for themselves. 
It says, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. They could not keep this to themselves. This was the message that they had to share with others. And that is true of each one of us who have personally received Christ as our Lord and Savior as well. We need to share this message with others. And during this season, there are so many different opportunities to do that. During the announcement time, we heard the opportunities that simply we as a church are giving to you, whether it's the Christmas Eve service or Sunday morning service, to invite your friends so that they can, share, can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or maybe you can sit down with them over a cup of coffee and just explain to them what Christmas really means to you. Again, there are all kinds of opportunities to do that. And we need to pray as a church that God would help us to be bold, that God would help us to be fearless in our witness for him. Let me close with a little story that I read just, just recently. In 1971, a man by the name of Ray Tomlinson was experimenting with ways people and computers could interact. When he sent a message from his computer through a network to a different unit in his office, he had sent the first email. Now, decades later, more than a billion emails are sent every day. Many contain important news from family and friends, but others may carry unwanted advertising or a destructive virus. A basic rule governing email use is, don't open it unless you trust the sender. God has sent us a message in the person of his son, and we can trust the sender. In the Old Testament, God spoke to his people through the prophets, and many rejected God's word. But it was all leading to this, from Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. I hope you'll receive this message for yourself. And after receiving it, we'll be bold in declaring the love that God has for us and for our friends as well. Remind you, there is somebody down front if you would like some, somebody to pray with. Uh, they'd be happy to spend some time with you. Let's uh, close our time together in prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for these few moments that you've given to us within your word. We pray that you would help us to reflect upon these truths, apply them to our lives. And Father, I do pray that if there's somebody here who's never yet received you, that you would just give them the courage, the understanding, the knowledge to reach out and claim you as Savior, as the Christ, as Lord of their life. And Father, we pray that you would help us who know you to be bold in our presentation of the gospel during this Christmas season. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.